let's be honest. 2020 was a pretty shit year for everyone. But thankfully, that's where video games came in, at least for some of us. Providing a wonderful little respite from everything going on. So, since I'm stuck in quarantine right now anyway, I might as well talk a bit, little bit about the games that helped me make it through this past year. Let's dive in. Heads up, not all the games I played in 2020 were released that year. Some are older. And while I did play more than just these games this past year, these are the ones that mattered the most to me. Number 10, Dragon Quest XI-S Echoes of an Elusive Age. This game originally released on the PS4 in September 2018, but the version I paid this past year was the Switch version released September 2019, which has also been ported to the PS4 and Xbox One as of December 2020. Dragon Quest is not reinventing the wheel. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, 11 follows a familiar JRPG structure of a chosen one who stands against the Dark Lord, something done not only in other games in the Dragon Quest franchise, but just one of the most common themes in RPGs in general. It does some new things, it sticks to a lot of the old things, but I liked it all the same. The S version of the game brings in some great additional story content, focusing on the hero's fantastic companions, I love all of them, an orchestrated soundtrack, and a fun 2D mode for a classic 16-bit feel. The core of the game is the same, um, and it made for a nice fallback piece for a year where I could return to something I had largely experienced before, with a few new pieces sprinkled in, that I didn't need to expend a lot of mental energy on, like I would have if it had been something wholly new. As true to form as this game is for being an RPG, it still has some twists, and the tone of it managed not only some good laughs, but some sincere, heartfelt emotion. The additions that the S version brings are welcome. Is it perfect? No. Nothing on this list is. But it did what I needed it to do. It entertained me again. Number 9, Ring Fit Adventure. Holy shit, I never thought I'd be putting an exercise game in any sort of a top 10 list I ever made. But I really enjoyed Ring Fit. Uh, it's a workout game presented like an RPG, and it's just fun. I look forward to getting up in the morning and doing 10 or 15 minutes of Ring Fit before I go into work. And it was a nice thing to have in 2020 when I did spend so much time at home. All the private gyms were closed, and I had trouble staying as active right. as I'd like to. Good. The premise is very simple. You and the Ring Kong controller coach, Ring, join up to defeat an extreme workout dragon named Drago and his monster allies. The Ring Con, as well as the leg strap, functions as the primary tools for your workout within the game, uh, both of which will house Joy-Con controllers for the motion controls. You jog, knee lift, squat, and do a myriad of other exercises to traverse 20 different worlds, fighting monsters with exercises like flutter kicks and mountain climbers, neither of which I'm good at, in turn-based battles, to defeat and seal away Drago. And it's just fun! I sincerely enjoyed it. There are lots of options as far as difficulty setting goes, from very easy to quite difficult, 
and the game features both warm-ups and cool-downs. The levels are also all really nice to look at and provide some variety to your workout. And you've got an arsenal of exercises to learn for fighting both Drago and his monsters. I found it a great way to keep myself active this year. Number 8. Paper Mario, The Origami King So it's been a long, long time since I played my last Paper Mario. That being Paper Mario and the Thousand Year Door on the GameCube. So I was going into this Paper Mario, released in July 2020, without two games before it worth of experience in the franchise. Those games being Paper Mario Sticker Star and Paper Mario Color Splash. Thankfully, this is a delightful standalone title that trades Mario's usual platforming antics for ring-based battles that add a layer of strategy and puzzle solving to enemy encounters. The game manages to set up not only a great atmosphere where it needs to, resulting in what felt like some genuinely tense or creepy moments for a game that's labeled a kid's game, but also gives some sincerely emotional moments that I honestly didn't see coming. The environments are pretty, especially the water in the game, and it has some great music, especially the boss battle theme. The ring-based battles are an interesting change of pace, but occasionally feel unbalanced. Would I play it again? Yeah, maybe in a few years. But this past year, I think it was something that I needed. Number Trials 7, of Trials of Mana. I love the Mana games. Since Secret of Mana released on the SNES in August 1993, I've been waiting on the sequel, a game called Seiken Dentatsu 3, to make it to the West. Sadly, it would take almost 25 years for that to happen, when the collection of Mana finally released on the Switch in June 2019. The collection including the original Adventures of Mana, brought over as Final Fantasy Reese. Adventure, it is a pleasure to make Secret of Mana, and Seiken Densetsu 3, renamed Trials of Mana. 
The name's Hawkeye. Renowned for and then Square Enix announced a remake for Trials of Mana in 2020. So I bought it immediately. <laughs> in essence, it's an action-style RPG where the battles are based on button combos and special skills, which are fast-paced and fun. The plot follows the same one the mana games usually do. A hero takes up the journey to save the Tree of Mana, and thus the world. In Trials of Mana, you get a group of three to six selectable characters, the primary of whom will be your main character and the hero of mana, while the other two will provide support in the form of magic or brawn in battle. My preference is Rhys, because I've always loved her character design and backstory, and then Hawkeye, who has some connection to Rhys's plot, and Angela, who's just a bamp for sorceress. She just is. Between the six characters, there are six different openings for the game, and three different possible endings to the game, including the final boss, uh, based on the main character that you choose. The remainder of the story stays the same, with some minor differences between characters. The new graphics are generally really nice, stylized enough that it's pretty, but still a touch cartoony, which fits with the style of the games. And the, the new soundtrack is fantastic. There's even some fun post-game content that's worth playing that wasn't in the original. If you haven't bought it yet, I'd recommend giving it a try. Number six, Among Us. Let me preface this by saying, I don't play a lot in the way of online multiplayer games. Beyond every year or so where I restart a WoW character, maniacally grind them up to level 20 while not interacting with a single other PC character, only to drop the game a week later, and then the cycle begins anew. Among Us was different though. Released originally in November 2018, it saw a huge boost in popularity in mid to late 2020 with the rise of memes about it. And that's when I started playing. It has a simple and satisfying gameplay loop where you and up to nine other people work on board a spaceship or other sci-fi themed map to complete minigame tasks. Up to three of your fellow players can be imposters who can sabotage and kill off crew members in games that generally take around 10 minutes or so to play. And it is the most fun I've had playing games with other people in years. The random nature of the imposter selection and the mystery of trying to figure out who they are while frantically doing tasks such as entering the trash or calibrating shields and praying not to get killed in the middle of a download creates a fun and very tense atmosphere. And being the imposter and working to sabotage is just as much fun. Adding to the atmosphere is some great sound design that works excellently with the simple but polished graphics. The maps are big and winding considering the size of your characters and often present their own challenges in, challenges in getting your task done. Like how easy it is to get killed in the electrical room! The game, made by indie team Innersloth, actually won an award at the 2020 Game Awards and they seem to be working tirelessly to bring new content more maps, and constant holiday-themed updates. All I can say is, keep up the good work, Innersloth. I can't wait to see what you have coming next. Number 5. 
Animal Crossing New Horizons. This one was an easy pick, and I know that it made it onto a lot of people's top 10 games of 2020 lists. But that's no reason to not put it on mine. It actually released the day before the state I live in started quarantine in March of 2020. While the pandemic and all the anxiety that came with it from being a quote essential worker unquote and what felt like the world falling apart, Animal Crossing New Horizons provided a welcome relaxing relief where there wasn't much to look forward to. And I know that a lot of people felt the exact same way about it. It's nice to be able to boot up the game and just wander around on my island, picking fruit, crafting, fishing, like life was a beautiful, simple thing once more, where I didn't have to panic about talking to people. The only people in the game to talk to are now cute little animals who all like me and suddenly don't have a lot going on beyond doing yoga in the plaza and sitting under trees to eat sandwiches. In addition to the soothing factor this game had on me, it's just beautiful to look at from the islanders, including Tom Nook, all having a soft felted feel and texture to them, to the brilliant sunsets and sunrises. Terraforming the island and slowly sculpting it with trees and flowers and water features is a fun addition, along with the seasonal events and some multiplayer as aspects. It's a relaxing retreat from a year that was rough, and with the regular updates re it receives, I'll keep using it for just that. Number 4. Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity I love the Legend of Zelda series. I've been playing since the first one on the original Nintendo Home Entertainment System. I've played something in the region of 200 hours on Breath of the Wild alone. And then, when Nintendo and Koei Tecmo decided to spring Dynasty Warriors-esque Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity in November 2020, I was hopeful but I really wasn't expecting too much, if I'm honest. But it really surprised me. I devoured this game in comparison to the amount of time it takes me to play other games. Like 45 hours in a week and a half, while still working mostly full time. It should be noted that I wasn't a big fan of the original Hyrule Warriors, it's fine, or of most of the Dynasty Warrior style games in general. But Age of Calamity was different for me. It might have been its connection to Breath of the Wild that cemented it for me, but something about it hit me in a way no other game of that style did. I had fun playing it the whole time. Not only do you have the big, over-the-top hack-and-slash battles of you versus hundreds of enemies that make you feel like an incredible badass, there are plenty of side battles and quests to complete to level your characters up or provide them with extra hearts or special attack bars, things like that. And there are lots of characters to unlock, 18 in total, all with their own special attacks and unique Sheikah root abilities, many of whom, whom I did not expect going into this game. And all of the characters felt fun to play. It looks nice, it's got a great soundtrack, it's just fun. If you enjoyed Breath of the Wild and want something familiar but different, I definitely recommend it.
Number three, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Yes, we waited for this game for years. For years, we were teased with its possible existence, and then in April 2020, we finally got it. No, it doesn't tell the entirety of the original Final Fantasy VII. It is only the Midgar section of the original game. Is it a complete game in itself? Absolutely. Square Enix stretched was originally about 5 hours of gameplay into 50 hours by enriching the environment, story, and characters. The city of Midgar is a massive place to explore. It feels incredibly lifelike, from the rendered in-time scenery, which is a hectic mash of machinery and organic material that portrays in new ways the pre-rendered backdrops from the original, to the numerous NPCs that fill this world. Not all of whom you can interact with, but there are plenty that you can. And the characters! Everyone is hot! And aside from that, they feel like real people. In the original game, Barrett doesn't really become a likable character until after the party hears his backstory in Corel. In the remake, we get so many loving little touches that better display his character as a rough and tumble but loving father in a brand new light. And he's not nearly the only character who got this treatment. With all the new context clues and character building, Cloud no longer comes off as a pompous asshole for the first chunk of the game. But we can see that he is a man battling not only psychological scars, but issues like his own anxiety and difficulty communicating with other people. And the Avalanche trio of Jesse, Biggs, and Wedge are given new life as well. They're fleshed out characters. The story itself has been fleshed out a great deal as well. Events and even a few new characters sprinkled in or changed around from the original game. In a surprising and interesting way that kept me guessing as to what was ha going to happen next. As someone who grew up with the original game, I can state that this game is everything I could have hoped for in a remake. And I hope that the same care and polish is present in the remainder of the game as it releases over time. Hopefully sooner rather than later. Number 2. Yakuza Kiwami 2. Speaking of feeling like an incredible badass, there's no better place to fill that urge than playing as gaming's most beloved himbo, Kazuma Kiryu, in the Yakuza games. Yakuza Kiwami 2 released in August 2018, and I've taken my time getting around to playing it. Like all of the other Yakuza games, save 2020's Yakuza Like a Dragon, you play as Kazuma Kiryu, a former Yakuza who was betrayed, and after the events of the first Kiwami, is trying to find some sense of normalcy in his life with his adopted daughter Haruka. But it's simply not meant to be. He's got another series of mysteries to solve and a lot more ass to kick. Not only is playing as Kiryu and beating the shit out of thugs and Yakuza grunts all around the beautiful environments of Kamurocho and Sotenbori ridiculously fun, there's plenty of other things to do. True to the Yakuza franchise, this world is jam-packed with distractions for you. From mini-games like Batting Cages, Mahjong, and even full versions of Virtua Fighter, as well as a surprisingly complex Cabaret Club mini-game, and dozens of side stories that can net you all sorts of rewards, including help from NPCs, all to do between story beats. Yakuza Kiwami distracts you from your boring life, and then takes a step further to distract Kiryu from his perhaps a little too exciting life. Some of the side stories alone are absolutely nuts. Absolutely worth playing, and then playing more to keep yourself from working on the story.
ジンドルが最高のプレイヤー Honorable Mentions These are other games that I played this year and enjoyed, but didn't quite make the cut. And finally, we get to number one. Number one, Fire Emblem Three Houses. Fire Emblem Three Houses released in July 2019, and in 2020 alone, I played two of the four possible routes, having played one route shortly after its release in 2019. Uh, currently totaling in over 250 hours that I've played on three routes to date. And this turn-based strategy RPG is definitely worth multiple playthroughs, as the four routes present differing stories and characters, some new routes as answering questions raised in others. The premise is that you are a young mercenary who, after rescuing some noble students of a monastery's academy, are offered a teaching job when you have no necessary qualifications to teach people who are largely near your own age. But you manage! The game functions differently than previous Fire Emblem entries, in that the monastery functions as sort of your base of operations, where you teach and train your students in a variety of possible skills and professions each week, and get one day off to fish, complete quests, return lost items, and generally work to get to know your students and build bonds with them and the rest of the monastery, st the monastery staff. At the end of the calendar month, you then complete a mission of, tur of a turn-based battle, which progresses the plot. So there's a lot more to this one than simply battle after battle. There's also some optional DLC that adds some new costumes for your player character, some additional stuff for your base, and a side story that gives you four additional characters to unlock in base game, uh, side story taking about 8 to 10 hours to complete. I do plan on talking more about this game in a later video because there's other stuff I want to mention about it, but I won't go into too much detail here. But for me, it proved to be one of the best games that kept me sane in the insane year of 2020. What a pleasure. As for me, my job is to stand here at this glorious entrance and leisurely watch over the comings and goings of everyone. Make folks smile, you know? Uh, and by that, I mean to vigilantly guard this entrance with my very life. Yes. Well, guys, that's been my top 10 list for the games I played in 2020. I'd love to hear in the comments below what games kept you sane this past year. And once again, thanks for watching and sticking with me through this insane past year. I look forward to seeing what 2021 brings. See you next time. Bye!